Hey, I'm Adam. How's it going? Well, probably can't answer me. But if you did, I, you know, I couldn't hear you and stuff. But, uh, so, I just got my new Behringer Odyssey in today. Uh, I got it with two-day shipping, so I'm probably one of the first people in America to have it. Uh, you know, uh, the U.S., I should say. And, um, and uh, as soon as I started playing with it, there's some things I noticed that you're going to need to know, like, right away if uh, you haven't used a lot of analog synths before, and especially this one, because it's got some weird stuff on it. Um, first thing to know, and it's super important, because I could see them really honestly getting a lot of returns from people who don't know this stuff. Maybe it's kind of newbie, but here it is. It's the fact that uh, it has an XLR output and a quarter-inch output. And the quarter-inch output is a low a volume signal, and the XLR is high. And so you'd think that you're supposed to take that XLR uh, cable and stick it in one side in the connector on the Odyssey and plug the other side of the XLR cable, you know, one of these guys with an XLR on both sides and plug it into your audio interface, into the mic jack, because it's what the Odyssey has. But if you do that, you'll clip the hell out of your audio interface because the mic input on your audio interface is meant to take a microphone, which is a very low signal. So even with the gain, even with the trim all the way down on your interface, it's going to be too loud for it. And so uh, you'll see you'll just get a distorted sound. Uh, the meter will be peeking out. It'll be no good. So it, it, the thing to use, really, is this, which is not what you think from looking at it. You know, the Odyssey has this to plug in and your interface, ha you use the quarter inch jack because the quarter inch jack is a, uh, mint is ha has lower gain. So that way you get the hot output of the Odyssey and you get in as hot as possible your interface without having to use much, if any, of the gain. So if you have an interface that has these kind of connectors on it, like this, you can see they have dual jacks. And the dual jacks can take a mic input or they can take a quarter inch. You know, like so. Okay? Even though it's the same connector, the quarter inch part of that same jack has the gain that's correct for this keyboard. The XLR, like I said, that's for microphones only, and you'll clip the hell out of it. So, why am I even talking about this? That's because the quarter inch jack coming out of the Odyssey is super low. In fact, really too low to even use. I will show you. You can see just how low that signal is. I mean, I can turn the gain up in the computer, but even with it all the way up, still not at the top. I got both oscillators on, and I'm at maybe two thirds. But, check out what the XLR jack is giving me. So, that's coming in the older input. And look how much hotter it is. Off the same signal. The drive is on, that's why it's a little bit too hot. Okay, you can see that the, um, the um, XLR hot output is on the right here and the low jack the quarter inch is here the XLR I've got the gain all the way down and I'm still getting almost all the way there if you wanted to see how the low jack really looks the quarter inch well look at the difference between those two outputs it's a, a big time different thing so moral is use the XLR jack in a pinch if you don't have this kind of cable, because again, this is the cable you're going to need for that. It's got XLR female on one side and this TRS cable to go into your audio interface. Okay. What you could do in a pinch is if you don't have that available and don't want to go to the store and play with your new Odyssey, well, you can use the headphone jack. Just take a quarter inch out a mono quarter inch out, uh, you know, single, not TRS, stick it in your headphone jack and plug the other side into your interface and that'll give you the level two. Watch, I'll switch it to the headphone jack. Okay. 
And you can see the low side is now getting plenty of level. Problem is, it's a little noisy. I don't know if you can see it on there, but at the bottom of that fader, I mean at the bottom of that meter, you can see a little bit of movement. And that's because the headphone jack is a little hissy. So, by all means, go ahead and record with the headphone jack if you have to, but get yourself an XLR female to TRS male cable as soon as you can and use that to record uh, the stuff that you care the most about. Okay, so uh, uh, next up is the VCA bias. I see this uh, come up on the internet and forums and stuff on the Neutron, and it's sure to uh, mess people up here too. It's this. You can hear how I'm not hitting a note and I'm getting some humming. The VCA bias is like an additional gain on top of what the amplifier, it's like, like a base point for where the VCA is. Generally, you don't need it unless you want a long sustaining note uh, like a drone or something like that. So what you want to do is don't have your VCA gain up. And while I'm there, I should probably mention that the drive, I have it on, and that makes a louder, dirtier sound. And that's how it sounds like off. Next up is um, the um, high pass filter scratchiness at the top. Okay, I'll put the drive back on just because it's a little louder right now. And you'll see when I get to the top of the HPF cutoff. Hear that? A little bit of scratchiness when I am right around the very top. And it's only when I move it. It's only when I move it because I put if I put it there. Sorry, I'll say that again. It's only when I move it because when I just put it there, you don't you don't hear the scratchiness. Unless you plan on riding the, uh, the high pass filter, then uh, you really don't have to worry about it. And most people don't use the high pass like that. It's kind of a set and forget kind of thing. So next up is the two octave switch, on mine anyway, is on the loose side. Okay, not on there real solid. You know, um, I've heard about other people's being like that too. They're probably all like that. But just in case, just so you know, you're not the only one that has it like that. Uh, basically, I love the Odyssey, so I don't think I'm picking on it. It sounds phenomenal. In fact, I'm going over these things to know about so you don't freak out and return it thinking yours is messed up. Because uh, I really love what Behringer is doing, and, um, and I want to see them keep making them. So I don't want them to get a bunch of returns on this over stuff that is just, you know, some of the joys of analog stuff. Uh, so, all right. Now, I'm going to talk about the PPC pads. They're benders, okay? The one on the right is, is up, and the one on the left is down, and you can hear they pretty much go nuts when you push them. I haven't been able to get a... a um, uh, um, you know, predictable bend. Let me see here. They just take so much pressure. No matter how hard you try and hold it stable, it just kind of sounds like a mosquito. I, I would say, uh, I don't think on anybody's there, they're like usable. I don't even know if on the original Odyssey how usable they were. Uh, they're kind of there as a, as a gimmicky thing. I was excited about having them, but after trying them for a few minutes, the vibrato one seems a little better. Okay, so um, now, uh, next up, you know, this isn't really an emergency thing like the other stuff, but you will want to get a tuner right away. Tuner software is fine because um, because the, uh, the Odyssey doesn't have octave switching. Okay, So although you might be able to tune it as far as uh, the fine tuning to get it sounding in tune with your music okay without looking at a tuner, you might be playing the wrong note. You might be thinking you're playing a C but you're playing a D sharp. Okay, so a tuner like that. What's behind me there? Shows I'm playing a C. Uh, 
I'll switch to one octave. I mean one oscillator, oscillator two. And if you look at the screen, you'll see I'll I'll get it in two. At least close enough for now. So tuner's important. All right. So uh, another thing is the glitchiness that happens at the end of the notes. So that's because it's a duophonic synth. So if you accidentally play two notes overlapping for a second, you're going to hear the oscillator split apart to where uh, the uh, uh, VCO1 is playing the lower note and VCO2 is playing the higher note for a split second. I'll try and demonstrate that. <laughs> So if you're a little sloppy there, I'll put it up some. Um, well, you can hear that the tail ends of one note when you, if that's still going on and you hit the next note for a split second, you're going to be getting uh, a chord, really, with oscillator one playing the low note, oscillator two playing the high note, and it will sound weird. I would say you can either learn to play like that, which is what most people internet see, on the internet seem to be saying, uh, but you can also quantize the ends. If you're using a sequencer in the computer, you can go to quantize ends, uh, and your notes probably won't be overlapping. The quantize makes them overlap, just go to your MIDI step editor and uh, make them not overlap. And then they will go cleanly from one to the next. Um, so that's pretty much it for the stuff you need to know right away. Um, thanks for watching. Now I'm going to make just a uh, starting patch just so you can get sound out of it and uh, show you how that's done. I'll start with nothing and um, I give you an initial, initial settings, okay? So we're going to start with our drive off in fact, we'll take all the sliders and put them down all the way, exactly the way that this thing would come to the factory. And then, of course, you get nothing. Okay, so um, here's where you start. First, we want to have uh, your v voltage control amplifier up. Okay, without that, you're not going to get any sound because that's the final output stage. I'd also recommend having it switch to AR, which is attack release. Basically means this top envelope here. Okay? If, if the attack and release are all the way down, it just means the note's going to sustain. So then, we're going to put the VCO, uh, VCF frequency up a little bit. Still not going to hear anything. We're just preparing for that sound to come through here. With the VCF frequency all the way down, you're basically filtering all the top end out of the sound. With the slider all the way down, the top end is also the bottom of the sound. So basically everything above the point here is what's going to be cut off or removed. So we're going to have to put it up a little bit to hear something. Now we're going to put up a VCO. We'll put up VCO1. And as soon as you do that, you will start to hear something. Okay, But you'll notice what I'm hearing is very low, very low frequency. Uh, and the reason why it's so low is the pitch of VCO1 is set all the way down. So we're going to just press a C or whatever note you want and bring it up towards the middle. I can tell I need a little more filter open. Okay, and then I'll look at my tuner back there. And get that to match my C there. You just got to get close with this course tune. Get it to the note you want, and then use the fine tune to get it the rest of the way. I'm looking at the tuner backwards because I'm looking on my, on my iPad here. And that's it. So now we can put up a VCO2. And VCO2 is very low. So just visually, I'm going to match it to the other one real quick at least the coarse tune part. And then I'll use the fine tune to get them the same. Actually, I gotta do that. 
there we go. So you can see just how important having that tuner is. All right, good luck and have fun.